Uh, basketball was my first identifiable passion. Uh, I fell in love with the game when I was five or six years old, and, and I'm so thankful that four decades later, basketball is still a major staple in my life. So having grown up in this basketball bubble, especially in the training space, I had always heard this urban legend of how insanely intense Kobe's individual workouts are. So the fact that I was on camp staff, I figured this was my chance and this was my shot. So my earliest opportunity, as soon as I got to camp, I went up and asked him if I could watch one of his workouts. And he was incredibly gracious and he smiled and he said, sure, man, that's no problem. I'm going tomorrow at four. And I got a little bit confused because I had just got done looking through the camp schedule and the camp schedule clearly said that the first workout with the players was the following day at 3.30 and Kobe recognized the confused look on my face and he clarified that with a, <clears throat> yeah, that's 4 a.m. Well, as you guys know, there's not really a legitimate excuse in the world on why you can't be somewhere at four in the morning. Uh, at least not in an excuse that a guy like Kobe Bryant's going to accept. So I would basically committed myself to being there and I figured if I was going to be there anyway, I may as well try and leave my mark. I may as well show Kobe how serious of a young trainer I was. So I came up with the plan to beat him to the gym. So I set my alarm for 3 a.m. The alarm goes off, I quickly jump up, I get myself dressed, I hop in a cab and I head to the gym. And of course, when I arrive, it's 3.30 in the morning, so it's pitch black outside. And yet the moment I step out of the cab, I can see that the gym light's already on. Even from the parking lot, I can faintly hear a ball bouncing and sneakers squeaking. I walk in the side door, Kobe's already in a full sweat. See, he was going through an intense warm-up before his scheduled workout with his trainer started at four. Now, out of professional courtesy, I didn't say anything to him. I didn't say anything to his trainer. I just sat down to watch. And for the first 45 minutes, I was shocked. For the first 45 minutes, I watched the best player on the planet do the most basic footwork and offensive moves. He was doing stuff that I guarantee you've already taught to middle school age players. But let's not get it twisted. This is Kobe Bryant. So he was doing everything in an unparalleled level of intensity. And he was doing everything with surgical precision. But the drills and the footwork he was actually doing was incredibly basic. Now his whole workout lasted a few hours. And again, when it was over, I didn't say anything to him. I didn't say anything to his trainer. I just quietly left. Uh, but my young curiosity kept gnawing away at me and eventually got the best of me because I had to know. So later that day at camp, I went up to him and said, Kobe, I don't get it. You're the best player in the world. Why are you doing such basic drills? And once again, he was incredibly gracious and he flashed that million dollar smile. But he said in all seriousness, why do you think I'm the best player in the world? Because I never get bored with the basics. I never get bored with the basics. Kobe Bryant on the Mount Rushmore of players and someone that has truly mastered his craft said his secret is the fact that he never gets bored with the basics. For me, that was a life-changing pivotal moment because it taught me that just because something is basic, well, it doesn't mean that it's easy. If it was easy, everyone would already be doing it. And as you all know, and more importantly, as your players are often misfed, they're told that it's okay to skip steps. They're told that it's okay to circumvent the process. Your players are constantly being told to be on the search for what's hot, what's flashy, what's new and what's sexy and ignore what's basic. But you all as coaches know the basics work. They always have and they always will. And the very first step to improving performance in any area of your life, it doesn't matter if this is something in your personal life or professional life, doesn't matter if it's something for you individually or collectively with your team, the first step is to actually admit that the basics work, but it's also having the humility to acknowledge that implementing the basics consistently every single day is never ever going to be easy. Now, I'm here for one reason and one reason only. That's to uh, pour into you guys. That's to add value to your lives and give you some practical and applicable strategies that you can implement immediately to be the best coaches that you're capable of, but also to make sure that you can help transform your players and pour these things into your players. Uh, I'm going to share with you things like how you can identify a performance gap, 
uh, show you the importance of learning how to be in the present moment and be where your feet are. And one of the most important that I learned from, and I don't believe Coach Jones is here yet, but Coach Jones at DeMatha taught me the importance of moving on to the next play. That no matter what happens, whether it's in your life or on the court, in order for you to be mentally strong and in order for you to perform at your highest level, no matter what happens, you always have to focus on and move to the next play. But to show my appreciation for the basics, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to the most basic component of coaching, and that's relationships. In essence, basketball is simply your platform. It's, it's, your, it's the, the canvas at which you paint. All of you are in the relationship business. And there are three relationships in particular that will determine your success as a coach and your impact and your influence as a coach and as a leader. And I'll give them to you now and then we'll unpack them. The first is the relationship that you have with yourself. The second is the relationship that you have with your colleagues and coworkers, your staff. And then the third, and usually the most obvious, is the relationship that you have with your players. So let's unpack each of those briefly. The one that most coaches unfortunately forget about is the relationship you have with yourself. But that's a dangerous trap because that's the foundation to which the rest of the house is built. So some rhetorical questions for you to, to reflect upon this weekend. Do you have high self-awareness? Do you have high self-discipline? When you make a mistake, which you will because you're a human being and you're fallible and you're a coach, do you have self-acceptance? Can you move on to the next play when you make a mistake? That's part of the relationship with yourself. But an equally important part is are you making the time to fill your own bucket first? Mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually if appropriate. Are you making the time to fill your bucket first? There's an old adage that's been around a lot longer than I've been around that, that says you can't pour anything out of an empty cup. Which means if your cup, your cup is empty, mentally, physically, and emotionally, then you're not able to pour into your players. You're not able to pour into your staff, at least not to the degree that you're capable of. So filling your bucket first is actually done in service of your players and your staff. They're counting on you to do that. See, you, when you decide to coach, and it doesn't matter what level you coach, when you're signing, to co when you are, are signing up to coach, you're basically agreeing to the unwritten rule that you will show up every single day as the best version of yourself. You owe that to your players and you owe that to your staff. So you have to make the time to become the best version of yourself because these people are counting on you. And this may sound really counterintuitive, but you showing up to practice or to a workout or to a game less than the best version of yourself is actually an act of selfishness. I know you expect it of your players. If you had a player that didn't get good sleep, didn't eat breakfast, didn't go in and, and get their treatment and do their corrective exercises, didn't come early to do their warm-up, didn't take care of their academic needs. If they didn't do all of those things, I promise you, you would label them a selfish player because they're not doing what they need to do to be the best versions of themselves to make the team successful. So we have to make sure as coaches, we don't fall into that same trap. And I truly believe, I mean, my heart goes out to coaches. I love you guys as much as any group on the planet because of the altruistic nature of what you do. You guys are servant leaders by definition. Your, your lives and your vocations are designed to pour into other human beings. And I have so much admiration and respect for that. But just make sure you're pouring into yourself first because it's the only way you can do those things to the highest level. Next is the relationship that you have with your staff. This is something I learned from Jay Billis. Uh, he taught me this very early and that is to be the type of teammate that you want to play with. Now that was probably great advice when you were players, but I want you to make sure you can extrapolate that now. I want you to think right now, if you are a head coach, I want you to think, and you can do this over the weekend, I want you to think of the list of traits of the best head coaches that you've ever been around or head coaches that you've ever worked for. And once you have that list, then do those things. If that's what you expect others to do, then that's what you need to make sure you do. Same thing if you're an assistant. Just imagine if tomorrow you got hired for a head coaching position. What would you look for in an assistant? What would be important to you when hiring an assistant? And then do those things now. Don't wait. Be the type of coach that you want to coach with and that you'd want to coach for. 
Now, if you are a head coach, it's really important that you are constantly pouring into and developing your assistants. You need to sit down and talk to them. Ask them, what are their goals? Many of them probably have the goal of being a head coach at some point. Not all of them, but many of them probably do. And that's important that you know that. Because there are things, are there things that you can do to take friction away from that journey? Are there things you can do to pour into them and to empower them to make their job of becoming a head coach maybe easier than it was for you? Sending the elevator back down when you reach the penthouse is incredibly important. So make sure you're pouring into your assistants. If you are an assistant right now, I want you to think of all of the things that you can do to make your head coach's life as easy as possible. That is your number one job as an assistant is to make the head coach's job as easy as possible. And it's one thing to do all of the things that they ask you to do, but if you want to be one of the best assistant coaches on the planet, be proactive and start doing things before they ask you to do it. Don't wait for them to tell you to sweep the floor before practice starts, just do it. Think, if I was a head coach, what things would I want my assistants to do? And then start doing those things. It's all about service, it's all about pouring in. If you're an assistant to your head coach, and if you're in a head coach, pouring in to your assistants. And then the third is the relationship that you have with your players. And that's indeed what it needs to be. It needs to be a solid, connected, trust-built relationship. And, and, and you can only establish that by creating that type of connection. Do your players know unequivocally that you care about them as a human being first and a basketball player second? If you want to get the most out of them on the court, they have to know that. They have to know it intuitively. They have to know that you have their back. They have to know that they can trust you. They have to know that you love them and that you care about them as a human being first and a basketball player second. If you make that type of connection and build that type of trust, the basketball stuff actually becomes easier to teach. Now, I did mention Jay Billis earlier, and, and Jay uh, has been an incredibly influential person in my life, and there's actually several people in this room that have been. And, and Jay, uh, as you guys know, is kind of the face of ESPN Game Day. And one of his responsibilities at ESPN is he has to watch each team practice the day before a game, so that the next day on air, he's got plenty of fodder to talk about, about teams' personnel and strategies and so forth. And back in uh, early December in 2010, uh, was going to be a game versus Duke and Butler up in New Jersey in the Meadowlands. Uh, and the reason this was such a highly anticipated early season game was because those were the two teams that, as we all know, met a mere eight months previously in the national championship, where Duke narrowly escaped with a win. And it's very rare that the two teams that meet on the biggest stage in college basketball meet in the early season of, of December. So this was a very highly anticipated game. Well, you guys know Jay is a Duke alum, so he went to watch Duke practice first. And he goes over and Coach K, clearly one of the best to ever do it, is talking to his team and he says, guys, we're going to beat Butler tomorrow because we have the distinct advantage. We're bigger than they are, we're stronger than they are, and we're more powerful than they are. We're going to beat Butler tomorrow because we have a distinct advantage. We're bigger, stronger, and more powerful. We're going to pound the ball down low, and we're going to get easy baskets around the hoop. We're going to out-rebound them, and we're going to contest every shot. Guys, we're going to beat Butler tomorrow because we have the advantage. And Jay left the Duke practice and was thinking, this could be a bloodbath tomorrow. Coach K, one of the best to ever do it, just told this team with great clarity why they have the distinct advantage. But he goes over to watch Butler practice. And of course, at the time, Butler is led by Brad Stevens, who many agree is one of the best to ever do it as well. Uh, and if you've ever met or read or, or watched any of Coach Stevens' stuff, uh, I mean, he's an absolute basketball savant. That's why he's the coach of the Celtics at present. And he's talking to the Butler Bulldogs, and he says, guys, we're going to beat Duke tomorrow because we clearly have the advantage. We are smaller, we're quicker, and we're faster than they are. We're going to beat them because we have the distinct advantage. We're smaller, we're quicker, and we're faster than they are. There's no way their big guys can keep up with us in transition. We're going to get fast break points. We can smother them with a full court press, and there's no way that they can come out and contest our corner threes. We're going to beat them tomorrow because we clearly have the distinct advantage. And Jay left that practice and was thinking, I got no idea who's going to win this game. Both of these brilliant coaches have high self-awareness, have high team awareness. They know what gives them the competitive advantage. They know what gives them an, an edge to be successful. And here's the cool part. They both were right. Both of those coaches were 100% right. 
And I share that with you for two reasons. One, I want to make sure every single year you guys are taking a look at what will give you an advantage. And, and for those of you that are in situations where you can recruit players and you actually have some say over who's on your team, then you can certainly recruit to your style of play. But for those of you that don't, you're just fed whatever hand you're dealt, it's very important that your style of play matches your personnel. You gotta have the horses in the stable to play the way that you wanna play. But I also bring that up because regardless of what type of talent you have or maybe don't have, you absolutely can and should make relationships your separator, your differentiator. I promise you that if you can build a stronger connection and stronger relationships with your staff and your players, and you can build trust, and you can get them to have both buy-in and believe in to what you're selling, to your culture, I promise no matter how good your team is, you will overachieve. Even if you have mediocre talent and mediocre athletes, if you get everyone to buy in and you have strong relationships, they will be better than mediocre. You will beat teams that you have no business beating on paper because you've created those types of relationships. So relationships can and should be a separator for every single person in this room. But like anything, relationships take time. Now, I'm incredibly fortunate that very early in my career, I was able to be mentored by some of the best in the business. Uh, three of them are here, uh, Coach Eastman, Coach Showalter and Coach David Atkins. I don't believe Coach Jones is here. We can all give him a hard time later for not being here promptly when I'm here to talk. But those four gentlemen have had a profound impact on my life and especially in my early coaching career. And all four of them, and you're talking about guys, I mean, again, as we just said, Coach Showalter has been coaching basketball longer than I've been breathing. No offense. <laughs> Coach Atkins and Coach... Eastman are in the NBA, have been in the NBA working with the best of the best. But very early, they taught me three coaching mantras that still serve me very well today. And they serve me well not only in basketball, they serve me well in the work I do with different businesses, and they actually serve me well parenting these three monkeys you see sitting up front. And these three coaching mantras, number one is the coaching mantra that it's not about me, it's about you. Number two that you have to connect first and then you coach second. Has to be in that order. And number three, there's only two options when it comes to coaching. You accept it or you correct it. So let's unpack each of those. It's not about me, it's about you. That's something every single one of us should whisper to ourselves every single morning that we wake up. That coaching is not about me. In this case, it's about my staff and it's about my players that it's my job to empower them and to pour into them to be the best they can be. And I will make all decisions based on what's in the best interest of this young person, what's in the best interest of my staff, what's in the best interest of my program. Now, if you're in the right place and you're working, those things will also be in alignment with what's best for you. This is not about going against the grain, but if you're doing what's best for your kids and your staff and your school and your program, that needs to be what's best for you. If it's not, then you're actually in the wrong job but it's so important that we have that mindset. The second one that these guys taught me is you connect first and you coach second. We've already touched on that. Before you even consider teaching someone, you know, the proper shooting mechanics or the proper footwork when making a move, before you do any of that, you have to make a connection with them. You have to find out what's important to them. You have to find out what motivates them. You have to find out how they like to feel appreciated. What's their preferred communication style? There's, there's two types of people in this world, and it starts at a very young age. There's those that can take an aspirin, and there's those that need to have the aspirin smashed up and put an applesauce to take it. I was actually one of the ones that had to have it in applesauce, and embarrassingly enough, I was, it wasn't until I was a teenager that I could even swallow a pill. I mean, that is embarrassing. But there's two types of players, and you have every one of those players are on your team. And your first goal as a coach is to figure out who can I speak directly to and who do I actually need to put it in a little bit of applesauce. There is no right or wrong, and this has nothing to do with him being a good player or a bad player, but more importantly, it doesn't matter your preference. All that matters is their preference. See, that's the key to communication, is you have to speak the other person's language. It doesn't matter if I can take the pill, if Coach Showalter needs it with some applesauce, then it is my job to give it to him with applesauce because that's the only way that teaching will take place, that learning will take place, that he will actually hear the message that I wanna communicate. So we have to create that connection first. And I promise you, 
Once again, learn from Coach Atkins, Coach Showalter, and Coach Eastman. If you create that connection first, the teaching of the game of basketball becomes so much more fluid and easier by default. Because you'll have players that want to get better, you'll have players that want to do what you say, you'll have players that will listen and lock in with their eyes, and they will do everything they can to the best of their ability because they've bought in and they believe in you, which is so important. And it can take a little bit of time to do that. Part of what makes coaching not just a, a science but an art is figuring out how quickly can I get these guys to trust me and build a relationship. I mean, I, I don't want to gloss over the fact, I mean, you, did you hear what Andrea said? Coach Showalter had up to 10 days to take a random group of kids from all over the United States, some that he had never met prior to training camp, and he had 10 days to establish a connection with them and build a level of trust that they could then go off to another country and beat teams that had been playing together for years. So he is a master at being able to create a connection first. If the first thing he did was walk in and start yelling at them about their shooting mechanics or footwork, there's no way he would have been 62-0. and 0. No way. It all starts with connections and relationships. So please don't think that this stuff I'm talking about, for those of you sitting there going, yeah, this is nice, but I'd kind of like to win some games. I'd kind of like to make players better. I feel you. This is how you do it. I promise. But you can't put the cart in front of the horse. And then the third one that I mentioned, the third coaching mantra that I learned from these guys, is you accept it or you correct it. Those are the only two things possible. Anything going on in your program at this very moment either needs to be something you condone, approve of, and accept of, or it needs to be something that you are about to change. Those are the only two options. And I see a lot of people taking notes. If you are taking notes, put this in your notes right now and then circle it, underline it, and if you have a highlighter, use that. Complaining is not a third option. Yeah, I hear some slight chuckles. It's an option that most people default to. Complaining, blaming others, and making excuses. I know you don't tolerate that of your players, so don't tolerate it of yourself or your staff. If you want to have a happier, more fulfilled, more significant life, do everything in your power to eliminate complaining, blaming others, and making excuses. If you hold yourself accountable for every single thing that goes on in your program, and you don't blame, complain, or make excuses, I'm telling you now, one, you'll be a better coach, but two, you'll actually enjoy the journey a lot more. So let's get rid of those things. If your players are consistently taking bad shots, guess whose fault that is? Oh, it got quiet, didn't it? Yeah, it's your fault. If your players take bad shots, that's your fault. That either means in some way, shape, or form you're accepting it and you're not correcting it or you're going behind the scenes and complaining. Man, my team is terrible. They take the worst shots possible. Yeah, you're the coach. That's on you. And as soon as you accept full responsibility for everything your players do, you'll get better. Do you have players that when you're speaking to them, they don't make eye contact or they roll their eyes? That's a great one, isn't it? Don't you love talking to a young person and they roll their eyes at you? If it happens more than once or twice, that's on you. That means you accept that behavior. So we have to make sure that we accept or we correct every single thing that's going on. And once we understand the importance of these three relationships and we use these three mantras to get better, now it's just a matter of doing them more consistently and doing them with, with authentic enthusiasm. Uh, I've had a chance to work with and meet a lot of really good players, uh, especially when they were younger. Uh, you know, I had met Coach Atkins when we worked together at Montrose Christian, and, and Montrose Christian certainly is most famous alum is Kevin Durant, but we had some other really, really, really high-level players there, even really great players that didn't play in the NBA. Uh, but one of the things that made that place so remarkable was the level of enthusiasm and that commitment to excellence. So aside from the players that I have a personal relationship with, uh, Steve Nash is my favorite player of all time. And back in 2004 is when Steve Nash won the first of back-to-back -back MVP titles. And that first year that he won it, he actually only led the league in two statistical categories. The first, and I heard someone whisper it, is assists, which as coaches, of course we love. We want players that share the sugar. We want players that, that want to set up a teammate so that they can be successful. Assist is a sign of a great leader and a great teammate. But what a lot of people don't know is he also led the league in touches. High fives and fist bumps and pats on the backside. Now, if you're wondering how I could possibly know that Steve Nash led the league in high fives, fist bumps, and pats on the butt, it just so happens that there was a research team from UC Berkeley, and they were conducting an official study, and they wanted to see if showing signs of enthusiasm actually equated to more wins on the court. 
So they hired a team of researchers to count every single time a player gave a high five, a fist bump, or a pat on the backside. Well, the Phoenix Suns were so enamored with this that they hired a full-time intern to do the same thing, but only count for Steve Nash. Now, how many of you have ever had a crappy coaching position? Anybody ever had like a GA? But yeah, imagine if that was your first coaching position. Yeah, you see that guy over there? Uh, every time he touches one of these big, tall, sweaty guys, I need you to make a tally mark. And I need you to do that for 48 minutes a night. Uh, oh yeah, there's 82 games plus playoffs this season. In the very first game that Steve, uh, the very first game that the intern counted for Steve Nash, he delivered 239 high fives, fist bumps, and pats on the butt. Steve Nash was a furnace of human connection. Now, you all know in the basketball world where physicality is appropriate, it's been physiologically proven that you can actually transfer energy through human touch. You can actually raise someone's game with a high five, a fist bump, or pat on the backside. But I don't want you to stop there. I want you guys to also start thinking, what are the emotional touches that you can make with your players and your staff? What are the emotional equivalents of high fives, fist bumps, and pats on the backside? This is where digital and technology can actually be something in our favor because they allow you to have touch points with your players even when they're not in front of you. If you have a player that, that has kind of an average practice, you know, it wasn't their best day, a simple text message you send them later that night saying, hey man, don't worry about it. I know the ball didn't go in today, but we're going to move to the next play. Tomorrow's a new day. Just something little like that, that is the equivalent of a high five, a fist bump, or a pat on the butt, and it makes a huge difference. And now we just have to get in the habit of making as many deposits as possible. Uh, 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 another mentor of mine, uh, who I know these guys know, but I don't know if you know, is a gentleman named Rich Shoebrooks. Uh, and Rich is a, a big wig with Nike and someone that's been around the NBA and game for a long time. And uh, he had learned this from someone else, but he was the one that taught it to me, so I'll give him credit. Uh, it's a concept called 10 assists. And this is something that I want to make sure that not only you guys implement, but I want you to implement this with your team and make it contagious. He said that every single morning, he wants his team to wear 10 rubber bands or maybe even 10 school of those like bracelets or rubber bands on their left wrist. And every time they give an off the court assist to one of their teammates or to one of their coaches, and an assist is anything that they do that adds value to that person's life. Anything that they do that, that makes a teammate's life just a little bit better or reduces a little bit friction. And anytime you do that, you take one rubber band off of your left wrist and you put it on your right wrist. But here's the deal, and this, we'll use this in a high school setting. You can't go home, after, you can't go home until you have all 10 rubber bands on your, your right wrist. So you can't leave school or you can't leave practice until you know for a fact that you've done nothing short of 10 extra things. This is not what you're supposed to do. You don't switch a rubber band over for going to class. You're supposed to go to class. But you absolutely switch one over when you go above and beyond to serve a teammate or to serve one of your coaches. If you want to see your cultures heighten immediately, you implement that and you hold your players accountable to that so that they actually are intentional and purposeful about dishing out assists to the people that are most important in that program, in the sanctity of that locker room. Now, you guys are the leaders. You're the upper 1%. You're giving up your weekend, which I know are incredibly valuable, especially for those of you in education working during the week, to be here. So I have zero doubt that most of you have already given out 10 assists before third period. But are your players and your assistants doing the same thing? See, that's ultimately what leadership is. You guys are phenomenal leaders. That's why you're here. But if you're not also empowering and producing other leaders, then you've kind of hit a ceiling on, on your overall impact. So can you make sure that everyone in your program is conscious about switching rubber bands from left to right? Now, I've spent, so far I've been talking about kind of from an individual standpoint. Let's take a look at three of the pillars that are required for creating an unbeatable team. And please know that when I say unbeatable team, I'm not talking about wins and losses. So for those of you that just quickly sat up a little taller and go, oh, we're not going to lose a game this year. No, you may lose all of your games this year, but you'll have an unbeatable culture and you'll have a culture that's based upon grit and resilience and buy-in and caring and commitment. And I can promise you, and I know as a, as a former coach, there's nothing fun about losing. Nothing fun about losing. Losing sucks. Like maybe that's a new t-shirt for Nike. Losing sucks. We all know it. 
But I tell you what, if you're going to lose, but you lose with kids that care, you lose with kids that give their best effort, you lose with kids that have buy-in and believe in, I know at night you'll still be able to sleep. So let's talk about those three pillars. The first is role clarity. The second is accountability. And the third is communication. Role clarity. You probably have an idea of what every player and every coach on your staff, on what their role is. But is that in harmony with what they believe their role is? You want to have a piece of humble pie. You go back and you have individual meetings with each of your players and coaches and you get them to articulate exactly what they believe their role is. How many minutes they think they're going to play, where they should be shooting from, what their job is in practice, and you do that, and then you see if it matches what you think. And I promise you, there's going to be some, some areas of dysfunction. But we need to eliminate that. We need to have clarity on what every person's role is. And for those of you that are head coaches, that is your job, is to provide that clarity. Make sure that everybody knows exactly what their role is. And once everyone has a role, and they know their role, then you need to empower them and encourage them to embrace their role, and then to star in their role. For those of you working at the high school level, and, and most of my time was spent at the high school level working with, with male basketball players. So that's the, the lens at which I saw most of the game. And I can tell you that working with some of the best alpha males to ever come out of the DC area, it's very easy to get a young man to buy into the role of, you're gonna start for us, you're gonna play most minutes, and you can pretty much shoot anytime you want. Is that a role that you'd like to accept? Yeah, I've never met a kid that doesn't want that role. But I need you, you're probably not going to play a whole lot this year, but I need you to come to every weight room session, every film session, every practice and every game, and I need you to bust your tail to make the guys in front of you better. I need you to, to act as if you're going to play every single minute, but you're probably not going to play a lot this year. And I need you to do so with high enthusiasm and high energy. That is a much harder sell. That is a much harder sell. But for those of you that have coached, you know that this player is just as important as this one for a variety of reasons. One, it's his job to make him better every single day in practice. Two, if anything happens to this young man, an injury or an academic issue, then he might, he might be the next man up. So I, I believe I learned this from Coach Eachman. Uh, be ready, because there might not be time to get ready. So you have to have an entire team of players that are fully committed. But we all know as coaches that this is an easy sell. This one's a little bit more difficult which means I have to work overtime and extra to make sure that I'm praising him and filling his bucket because he has a role that he doesn't necessarily want. Every player wants that role, but can I get him to accept the role that is what's best for us? That's the whole we over me concept. And to me, that is the biggest challenge in coaching is getting people to buy into a role that they don't necessarily want themselves. And there is an art and a science to doing that. And then clearly we need to make sure that there is a mutual respect and appreciation and admiration for each and every role. You might be our star player, but you better appreciate and respect and tell him how much you appreciate him coming every single day to set the table so that you can play. And we have to make sure that that's something that's contagious. Second, let's talk about accountability. One of the most important phrases you can tell your players and even tell your own children, for those of you that have them, is holding someone accountable is something you do for them. It's not something you do to them. Kids get that a little bit twisted. I remember that, you know, when I was at DeMatha as the strength coach, I would sit on the end of the bench, which meant if you sat next to me during games, you weren't getting in unless we were plus or minus 30. You were probably going to keep your shooting shirt on for most of the game. And I remember those kids having conversations with them that they'd say something like, why is Coach Jones always getting on me in practice? I don't even play. Well, he gets on you because he loves you. He gets on you because he cares about you. He gets on you because he still wants you to be the best player that you're capable of. So when you hold someone accountable, that is the best gift that you can give them. Because when you hold someone accountable, you're basically saying, I think you're better than what you're showing me right now. I think you're capable of more than what you're showing me. And because I believe in you and I care about you and I care about us, I'm not going to let you slide by doing less than you're capable of. So holding someone accountable is the best gift that you can give someone. And if you're wondering how you get that type of buy-in, let's not overcomplicate it. Just ask for permission. One of the beautiful things about basketball is the small number of people on a roster. That's what makes football more difficult. 
at most, you probably have 12 to 15 players and three to four coaches that you have to build a connection with. That's much easier than having 80 to 90 players and 15 to 20 coaches. So you should be able to have this conversation. There's two questions that you need to ask every player on your team. Question number one, do you give me permission to coach you? Do you give me permission to do everything in my power to make you the best player possible? Now you're gonna get a yes sir or a yes ma'am. You're gonna get compliance. Then the next question is, and this is the key, do you give me permission to hold you accountable to the standards we've set? If for any reason you don't get a yes sir or a yes ma'am, then that person does not belong on your team. And I know making cuts are one of the hardest things to do in coaching. That might be the single worst day of any high school coaches uh, of year is the day that you have to cut players because no one enjoys that. But if someone's going to look you in the eye and tell you that they're not coachable and they don't give you permission to hold them accountable, hopefully that will ease the sting because you need to get rid of them. But they're going to comply. And now you have a young person that said, you can coach me and you can hold me accountable. So what do they really have to say when you do it during the season? Nothing. Now, they are human beings, so they will naturally default to complaining, to blaming others, and to making excuses, but we can quickly move past that. Because all I have to say is, wait, you, you gave me permission to coach you. Don't you remember in our preseason meeting you said I could hold you accountable? Well, that's what I'm doing right now. And they won't have anything to retort. They'll understand that. It'll be an inherent buy-in. And one thing that unites all human beings, outside of sociopaths, is we don't like disappointing people that we care about. So when you've set this groundwork and you've asked for permission and you've clearly articulated your standards, players are going to want to stay in bounds. They're not going to want to disappoint you. So most of your problems will be eliminated simply by asking for permission. And then lastly, let's talk about communication. Just know as coaches, you are always communicating something. Even when you're not speaking or coaching or in some cases yelling, you're still communicating something. You're communicating with your nonverbals. We all already kind of chuckled before that when a player rolls their eyes, they're communicating something to you, aren't they? We won't say it aloud because my kids are here, but they're communicating something directly at you. And it's the same thing with us as coaches. We have to be very careful how we communicate. You know, one of the things that I had to learn very early was that it's not even just about the language you choose. Um, I will say that one of the areas I'm very proud that I've improved on is I use a lot less colorful language now than I did in my younger days because I found that I don't need to use it. And now that if I do choose to pepper in a, a, co a colorful piece of language, it, it was done with so much intention that it'll actually make a point. But you have to think about everything else in your repertoire. Sarcasm is a big one. I'm an incredibly sarcastic person. Sarcastic comments are some of the funniest things. I mean, if you ever want to hear some good stories, you go find David Adkins later today and talk about some of our text messages ex exchange. They are absolutely sarcastic. But you also have to own the fact that while it may be funny to you, it may not be funny to the person on the receiving end. And that you might make a, an, an under your breath sarcastic comment during practice that embarrasses a player or emasculates them. And now you're doing the exact opposite of what you're trying to do as a coach. You're actually lowering their performance instead of heightening it. So just own every single message that you have. And one of the most important things about communication is the unconscious message. Right now, you all are doing an amazing job of listening. I can see right now, every one of you is communicating a message to me based on your body language, based on your eye contact, based on whether or not your head's nodding and your pen's moving. You are communicating a message to me. Well, think about the same thing with your players and your staff. If you actually set your phone down and you make eye contact and have warm body language and you ask insightful questions and you listen to what your player has to say or your coach has to say, what's the unconscious message you're sending them? I care. You matter to me. I value you. You are important. So get in the habit of asking questions and listening. It's one of the most important ingredients to strengthening connections. And every single time, every single time, you connect with another human being, it could be in a 30 second elevator ride with a stranger or it could be a player that you've coached for the last three years. You're doing one of two things. You're either strengthening your connection with them or you're eroding it. Those are the only two things possible. A, a snide, sarcastic remark, remark will erode a relationship. Asking a player a question and then intently listening on to their answer will strengthen that connection. And from a communication standpoint, 
And, and to me, this is one, and, and I can't stress enough how influential Coach Showalter and Coach Eastman and Coach Atkins have been. I've learned from these guys that a very mediocre coach, let's imagine in a scenario where you're doing some scrimmaging right now, and a player makes what you deem to be a boneheaded pass, and they turn it over immediately. The very mediocre coach is going to stop practice, is going to berate that player, tell them why that was a dumb play, and then resume practice. An elite level coach is going to stop for a second, do their best not to let their emotions override their standards, to take feelings out of it and not make any judgments and say, okay, hold on for a second. Uh, I believe at that time you thought that was the best pass to make. What were you seeing? Why did you think that was the best pass? Get them to articulate it. Get them to own it. Now, clearly it wasn't a good pass because it got turned over. So maybe ask them, uh, since clearly that wasn't the best pass to make, what's another option? What was something else that you could have done? And then listen. Don't make judgments about your players. Actually listen. I don't think there's a player in the history of the game that's coming down the floor and goes, I'm going to make a turnover. Watch how mad Coach Atkins gets right now. Oh my gosh, this is going to be awesome. Oh, look at him. Look at his face. No. At that moment in time, using their possibly limited basketball IQ, they thought that was the best play to make at that time. So don't chastise them for that. Figure out and dive deeper into why. And I promise you, coaching is all about making things sticky. It's about making things memorable. So if you start asking players why they made that decision and then what they could have done instead, they'll recall that information much more than you stopping practice, making a snide remark, maybe MFing them a couple times, and then resuming practice. And that's all about communication. So sharpen your communication tools. Now to put a big bow tie on all of this, I want to talk about the importance of living in the present moment. Because living in the present, or as they say at DeMatha, playing present is the most important key to you coaching to your highest level and to your players playing to their highest level. And the short definition is to simply be where your feet are. Wherever your feet are, make sure that's where your head and your heart are as well. The longer definition, as you guys see, I like to, to teach in threes, is to make sure that you focus on the next play, is to make sure you focus on what you can control, and to make sure you focus on the process. If you guys can do those three things, you'll coach to your maximum level, and your players will play to their maximum level. First, next play. If any of you do or have been to a DeMatha basketball game and you sit within earshot of Mike Jones, you will hear him say and make this hand motion, next play, probably a few hundred times. You missed a layup, it's okay, next play. I, I know, you turn the ball over, it's okay, next play. Yeah, the referee missed a call. It happens occasionally in high school basketball. Next play. Why does Coach Jones want the team at DeMatha to focus on the next play? It's the only one they can do anything about. They can't do anything about the missed layup, the turnover, or the referee's missed call. Those plays are over. So the sooner he can get them focused on the next play, the better. Now remember, anything that we want our players to do, we have to model. I won't ask for show of hands because I don't want to call anyone out, and I think some of you might lie anyway, but how many of you have ever been caught up on a referee's poor call or missed call well after the fact that it happened. Good. Nobody? Oh, that's awesome. Do you guys realize what you're modeling for your players when you spend three minutes barking at a referee over a play that just happened three minutes ago? You're modeling for your players that we don't need to be in the present moment, that it's okay to worry about the past. And I know part of your job as coaches is to work the referees. I'm not taking that away. Be succinct, be clear, and then move on. In the history of the game, a referee has never overturned a call simply because you got angry. And they're certainly not going to overturn one that happened three minutes ago. So let it go. It's over. And move to the next play. Now let's talk about controlling the controllables. There's only two things in this world that you and your players have 100% control over 100% of the time. That's effort and attitude. So that's mostly what we should be pouring into. We don't control most of what goes on in this world, but we control our effort and we control our attitude. Here's something that I want you to tell your players. Working hard is a choice. They probably already know that. Here's the part you need to make sure they understand. Not working hard, well, that's also a choice. Players choose whether or not to sprint back on defense. They choose whether or not to box out. They choose whether or not to step in and take a charge. They choose whether or not to dive for a loose ball. And our job as coaches, is to empower them and encourage them and inspire them to make those choices as consistently as possible. So effort is a choice, and effort's the number one thing that we have to hold people accountable for. There's no excuse for not giving a good effort. There are reasons, 
Yeah, if you didn't get sleep last night, you've had the flu, you're hungry. There's understanding reasons why us as compassionate human beings can see why someone doesn't give a good effort. Doesn't mean it's acceptable. Just because something is understandable, it doesn't mean that it's acceptable. So we have to make sure that we are always holding people accountable for effort. But we need to get them to do that on their own because the more you have to coach effort, the less you get to coach basketball. The more you coach effort, the less you coach basketball. So think about accountability. If right now, if your program only has vertical accountability, that is you're the coach, you tell them what to do, they do it, you're gonna be mediocre at best. You all need to make sure that your teams have horizontal accountability, which means they hold each other accountable, which means they use peer pressure. They get mad at each other when someone's late for practice or someone misses a class or someone doesn't touch the line during sprints. When someone doesn't touch the line during sprints and you as the head coach are the fourth person to say something to them because the three players closest said something first, now you've got something really special. And then talking about attitude, the other half of that. Attitude is always a choice. You don't control what happens in this world, but you absolutely control the response you have to it. And if you want to be a, a high performing coach and you want to be a high or have high performing players, you have to encourage them and yourselves to always choose a response or reaction that moves you forward, not one that takes you back. And then lastly, the process. We know what it is that you guys want. You want to win championships. You want to win games. I get it. But let's not get caught up in that. Let's focus on the daily process of what needs to be done to make that more likely. Focus on what you can do today. If your goal right now is to win a WCAC championship, in March of 2020, then all you have to do is wake up today and say, what's something I can do today and we can do today that gets us a little bit closer to winning that championship? That's all you have to worry about, is just focus on the process. And if you can focus on the process and you get everyone in your, your team to buy into the importance and focus of effort and attitude, and you get everyone to have a mentality of quickly moving to the next play, you guys will be doing everything you can to coach and play in the present. And that is the only way possible, only way possible that you can perform at your highest level. Now, to put a big bow tie on everything and wrap things up, I opened up by telling you guys the story uh, of the Kobe Bryant Skills Academy, which I believe was one of the first times I had a chance to, to work with Coach Eastman, who ran those academies. And there was a, a college player there uh, that did not have the same resume as everybody else. And quite honestly, he didn't have the same physical stature as everyone else. He looked like he was 14 and he had just finished his freshman year in college. But all of us coaches noticed there was something different about this young man. And it was palpable. There was just something different about him. The most impressive of which was at the end of our first workout. And Coach Eastman would lead two workouts a day for three straight days. And these were grueling training camp type workouts. At the end of the first workout, just based on sheer proximity, this young man said, Coach, talking to me, we had never formally met. He said, Coach, will you rebound for me? Because I don't leave the gym until I swish five free throws in a row. Swish five free throws in a row. You guys realize if you couldn't let your players leave the gym until they swish five free throws in a low, every single one of you would die in a gym somewhere in the D.C. area? Yeah, but that was the standard this young man had. And there was a few times where he would swish four in a row. He'd hit a little bit of the rim on the fifth one. He'd still go in. He's still mathematically perfect, but that wasn't good enough for him, so he'd start over. And if memory serves, it never took him longer than 12 to 15 minutes to swish five in a row. As many of you have already guessed, that young man's name was Stephen Curry. And Stephen Curry will go down in history as the greatest shooter that this game has ever seen. And it's not by accident. And it's not by luck. And it's not even because his dad played in the NBA. It's because he's willing to hold himself to unparalleled standards. And that is the thought that I would like to close with. The standards that you set today will determine who and where you and your team will be tomorrow. And with that, I want to thank you all so much for your time on this beautiful Saturday morning. I appreciate you guys very much. <laughs>